with just a title slide. So tonight we're going to be talking about transportation and we're going to focus on the Sierra Club's Clean Green Commute Campaign. And if you don't know what that is, you're going to find out tonight. And importantly, you're going to find out how to get involved and help us move it forward. Uh, pun fully intended and uh, stolen from the Issue 7 campaign. Our speakers tonight, as has been mentioned, are Cam Hardy, who's the president of the Better Bus Coalition, a uh, growing folk hero, not only in Southwest Ohio, but uh, has been engaged now to talk all across the country on the topic of transit and improving the things that transit connects and, uh, and makes better in our lives. And so we're really excited to have Cam with us tonight and um, really excited for all the things that he's gonna share with us. Unfortunately, Mark Simon, who is an employee of the Southwest Ohio Regional Transit Authority, had a non-medical, so no one should worry about anything, uh, emergency this evening, and is not gonna be able to join us. Fortunately, he and Cam have a mind meld, and Cam can probably talk about anything and more uh, that Mark was gonna otherwise present to us about, namely, what Metro is gonna do with all this money that they're gonna start uh, receiving uh, starting in January. And then finally, we've got Kevin Henschold, who, as Nicole said, really does all kinds of things for us um, and for other organizations, wears a lot of hats and is a fantastic and valuable member of all of our teams. Uh, recently elected to be an executive committee member for the Ohio chapter of the Sierra Club, and we thank him for his leadership and look forward to hearing him tell us about our electric future. Um, so if I can go to the next slide here. I'm trying. See, it, sorry about that. I have a bit of a lag and I tend to go forward. Okay, why are we talking about transportation? Probably a lot of you, and I see some wonderful familiar faces, by the way, on video right now, some folks I haven't seen in a few months. So hello to everybody out there. I uh, look forward to engaging you in our discussion later. Um, so a lot of you have probably you know, heard this spiel before, but why are we, the Sierra Club, talking about transportation? Well, it, it, it really cuts to the core of so many of the issues that we work on in the conservation space, um, including climate change, energy, land use, public health, equity, um, and the list goes on. Uh, transportation connects us to all of the things that make our lives move forward and, and make us um, part of society. And uh, it's been very interesting, as I said um, earlier, to see how transportation is intersecting with some of the societal problems that we have going on right now. Um, it really is fundamental to so many of the issues that we talk about as social and environmental advocates. Um, the Sierra Club is focused on what we like to call the three E's of transportation, protecting the environment. Of course, that's one of our core missions. Uh, promoting a sustainable economy, i.e. one that works for everybody and does not ravage our planet. And then finally, but certainly not uh, least importantly, is promoting equity for everybody, regardless of how you get about, need to get about, choose to get about. Um, we all need to have uh, travel options available to us, and we need them to be accessible, safe, and clean. And so the Sierra Club um, hopes that we can do things to move that forward as well. So um, just on the environmental front, you probably all know that the transportation sector is a major contributor to carbon emissions, uh, both in the United States, locally, and of course, globally. Um, the uh, statistic you see on your screen is from the 2018 Green Cincinnati Plan, which noted that at that time, transportation accounted for about a third of our local carbon emissions. Um, folks on the line can certainly correct me when I'm wrong, but I believe that that uh, percentage has actually grown as we've done some good work to reduce the impact and the footprint of things like our built environment. So um, unfortunately, transportation is a growing uh, uh, component of our emissions uh, portfolio, but we're hoping to shrink it through our work. Um, of course, global climate change is not the only uh, problem associated with emissions and other pollution uh, that resolves from, from traffic and transportation. Acute air pollution is a specific problem here in Southwest Ohio um, the statistics and facts that you see on your screen there were provided to us by one of our members, Dr. Chris Coran of Northern Kentucky University, who's done some really great scientific work studying these issues. Um, and you can see that, you know, traffic emissions are specifically linked to childhood illnesses um, and other uh, really sort of tragic 
uh, problems that our society is wrestling with. And so this is again, an issue not, of the, not just of the, about the environment, but also public health, equity, and other social issues. Um, last, uh, but certainly not the, the final thing about transportation, but what our, our, our third main bucket is land use. Um, cutting down on vehicle miles traveled, which is sort of a jargon that we use, uh, not only cuts down on emissions and air pollution, but it also helps us make our land use more efficient. And that has uh, other benefits such as preserving habitat, farmland, um, historic communities, neighborhoods, et cetera. And so we always wanna think about land use when we think about transportation. And certainly public transit and public transportation is a key component of that. I am attempting to move forward on my slide here. And I apologize right now because I can't see the chat. So if anybody needs to interrupt me, you might need to do it on the... There we go. So what are some things that the Sierra Club is doing to combat these problems that I was just talking about? One thing that kind of wraps a bunch of those uh, solutions together is something that we've branded the Clean Green Commute Campaign. And the Clean Green Commute Campaign not only seeks to improve public transit by making it more accessible to people, more efficient and more useful, but we also want to make sure that our vehicle fleets, transit authorities, cities, other large uh, institutional fleet users um, are transitioning those vehicle fleets to clean zero emission vehicles. Um, and so there are a number of opportunities to do that right now as we speak in 2020. And I think Kevin's gonna introduce some of those concepts to us a little bit later on. Um, speaking of zero emission vehicles, certainly they are on the rise in the United States. Uh, ownership is on an uptick. You see more and more um, manufacturers get into the game, uh, more models being offered, and all those models are becoming better and more efficient as time goes by with greater range um, and lower cost in a lot of uh, instances. So yeah, e-vehicles e and zero emission vehicles are really becoming uh, realistic, not just for transit fleets, but for, uh, for everybody. One of the action items that I'm gonna leave you with tonight, we can talk a little bit more about this later, is to contact your state legislator about a uh, emerging issue. Today, the Ohio House of Representatives um, Committee on Transportation and Public Safety held the first hearing on a new bill, House Bill 546, that would reduce the fees that owners of electric and hybrid vehicles have to pay annually in order to register those vehicles with the state of Ohio. Last year, um, in 2019, the legislature imposed a $200 a year fee on electric vehicles and $100 on hybrids. Um, at the time, we noted that that was not uh, proportional either to what people were paying in the titular gas tax or what people are paying in other states. Um, Consumer Reports actually had a, an article that they published in February that demonstrated that um, electric vehicle owners in Ohio would pay 36% more in fees than the average gasoline uh, consumer. So we're seeking to rectify that. And one of the ways is by passing House Bill 546, which would cut those fees in half. Um, again, that had a first hearing today. So our legislators are hard at work considering it. And if you wanna contact your House of Representatives or, or State Senate representatives and tell them that you support that bill and similar legislation, uh, that would really help us move forward. And we'll probably have some more information to share about that later. There's a companion bill in the Senate, uh, the Ohio Senate called Senate Bill 257, which would, um, as a complement to reducing the annual fees on electric vehicles, provide a purchase credit for people who are buying electric vehicles. So uh, some important things that the legislature can do to uh, enhance and promote the use of electric vehicles in Ohio. Um, let's see, moving on to my next slide. Uh, we're gonna get back to this too, but you can help. That's why we're all here. So we have what's called an add up campaign on the internet, which is an interactive way that we can communicate with our volunteers and you can learn more about our campaigns and get regular updates on them. So if you can, um, in some capacity, copy that link on your screen right there. And if you haven't already signed up for our add up campaign, that will directly plug you in uh, to our efforts. We've been meeting every Tuesday night virtually at 5.30 to discuss our campaign and, and next steps. 
and uh, we invite you to join us. We'll remind you of that later in the evening. I'm going to stop talking unless there's anything else that Nicole or Kevin or Cam thinks I need to say. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to Cam because I think Cam and Kevin are going to be what everyone came to see tonight. So without further ado, Cam, thanks so much for being with us tonight. I'm going to just put uh, a slide with your name and the Better Bus Coalition logo on the screen here. There we go. And uh, I'm going to let you take it away. Well, thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, this is great. Um, I, I enjoy talking about this stuff. You know, when I um, first started on this whole crusade about public transit and making our bus system better, um, I never pictured myself like just being so like excited about talking about these things and, you know, advocating for this. So this is, uh, this is great for me. You know, this is, this is fun. So, um, yeah, I'm looking at that logo, the Better Bus Coalition. Um, I'll, I'll start from the beginning. So about actually five years ago, um, I started on this whole crusade about wanting to fix our bus system. You know, uh, our bus system uh, at the time was really bad and our buses was breaking down all across the city. And, you know, uh, our, we had buses that was out that was 25 years old, you know, uh, and it was just really, really bad. And, you know, I was in school at the time, working security, and I just noticed that I was on a, a bus that broke down every other day. Some of them didn't have AC, some of them didn't have heat. You know, uh, it was serious. And I was just really irritated about it because I'm like, you know, why is it this way? You know, uh, why does it have to be this way? You know, I grew up riding a bus uh, here in the city. Excuse me, I was just acting up a little bit, but uh, <laughs> I grew up riding a bus in the city. My mother taught me how to ride the bus when I was probably like eight years old. So I remember the bus system being pretty good, you know, growing up. And, you know, uh, and digging into more of that, the reason that it was so good in the 90s is because that's where all the jobs were downtown. So it made sense for the time for all of our buses to travel downtown and uh, travel back up. Um, I think Mark, uh, I was talking to Mark the other day and he said that uh, 43 of our 46 bus routes go downtown. I mean, that's ridiculous. That, uh, that is a very, very outmoded, outdated way of, you know, rolling the transit system. So. You know, if you live on the east side of town and you're trying to get to the west side of town, you got to go downtown first to get there. You know, and you can spend up to two hours, you know, traveling one way on the bus. Uh, when I when I lived in Mount Airy, it took 50 minutes to get downtown from Mount Airy. I mean, I'm, that's in the city limits. That's a 15 minute drive, you know, so it's very, very frustrating. Um, to try to get around on transit these days. And I think part of it is because, you know, it's looked at as just really, really, it's like a poverty program. You know, it's just something that you give to people. It's something that you just have to accept. There's really no, uh, there's really not a true appetite uh, for public transit in this region. And, you know, uh, even, Though issues have not passed, I still feel like some of that sentiment exists. You know uh, that there's just really politicians are really out of touch when it comes to what uh, a world class bus system should really look like for a city our our size. You know, and it does not. It has. It should be for everyone. You know, um, and it's really not. It's not designed that way. I should say because it is for everyone. But the fact of the matter is that everyone doesn't use it, and that's because it's not very convenient. So anyway, uh, that is part of the reason that we, well, I started on this whole, well, five years ago, it was just me, you know, ranting about transit. Um, and uh, it started on social media, it was my Facebook, and I, st I joined a group that the Enquirer um, had and that's a local paper here for people that are from around here. But that's our local paper. 
they started a Facebook group called the uh, Greater Cincinnati Politics. And so I would go in there and like ran about my bus breaking down or like post a picture of a real crowded bus, you know, uh, because that was another issue. It's like you would get on some buses and they would just be packed to the brim. And like, that's because it's not running very frequently, you know, and I posted these pictures and stuff like that. And, you know, uh, I'm getting a lot of uh, feedback about it. A lot of trolls. I mean, you know, I did get some, positive feedback at the time, but starting out, a lot of people really didn't pay attention. It was just like, you know, another person just talking about something or whatever. So, but, you know, as that group grown, people discovered, you know, I mean, I just simply wanted to have a conversation. And I was very civil uh, among a bunch of people who really was not civil. And if you're in that, if you're in that group now, you know what I mean? It's not that simple today either. So <laughs> it's never uh, been a big uh, fan of civility in there. But for, for myself, you know, I didn't take it personal. People attacking me about this. You know, I kept it real civil. I keep saying that word. But anyway, it caught the attention of uh, the editor of the Enquirer at the time. Her name was Cindy. And so she asked me if I wanted to write an op-ed about it. And I said, sure, you know, I'll write something about it. So uh, it was titled, you know, Drop Politics, Focus on Public Transportation. That's the first thing I wrote for the Enquirer uh, about this issue. And, you know, uh, again, I got feedback about it. I posted it, you know, it was good. And so, you know, just continuing into that, I met, I went to the Neighborhood Summit and I had met a couple of other bus riders. Uh, if it, for people who don't know who the, what the Neighborhood Summit is, it is a yearly uh, event that the city puts on. Uh, and basically, it's just like a bunch of activists talking about, you know, how to make our neighborhoods better and share information and things like that. Uh, it's very, very useful. And uh, I went there. Uh, I would say that was 2016, I went there. And I met some other bus riders who had read the op-ed, you know, and was like, you know, you're right. You know, what can we do about this? And so uh, within that, we, uh, we continue with the op-eds and stuff like that. I think I wrote two more. And then uh, we formed uh, what is now the Better Bus Coalition. But even before we formed the Better Bus Coalition, we were just meeting that. Japs every week. Uh, that's a bar downtown, you know, and just talking politics. Uh, well, not really politics, but really just more about the bus system um, and the politics within that over a drink or two. And, uh, you know, one Wednesday we were there uh, and we just stood up and said, you know what, we're going to make this official. And uh, I want to say that was 2017 because it was a, a municipal election. And, uh, excuse me, it was a local election. And we wanted to capitalize on our issue during this time because really it was boring election. I mean, uh, our current mayor was running, he was up for re-election. There really wasn't no issues that was really like you know, it wasn't no streetcar or anything like that. So, <laughs> right? So it was just a very boring election. So we're like, we can make it about buses. So we, you know, created this coalition, put our people in place. We started going to various events, you know, political functions, candidate functions, uh, you know, talking about this, talking about, you know, asking politicians what they were going to do to fix, um, you know, our public transportation system. And I'm um, sorry that Mark's not here, but that's where Mark really played a vital role because he provided us with the data uh, to really go out into the community and make it uh, easy for people to digest because talking about buses is not, I wouldn't say like it's the most exciting thing to do, but you know, uh, it's important. And so for us, that is the reason that we wanted to do it. But Mark made it very easy because he 
broke down the data. I mean, you know, what routes had the most people on them? You know, where was the frequency gaps? You know, uh, and within that, we created a, a Better Bus Coalition plan. Uh, and you can find it at our website, uh, betterbuscoalition.org. Um, it's on there. And we created that, took a few months, and we did all the mapping. We did all the statistics in it. Uh, and it's pretty accurate as to, you know, what the vision it, uh, of transit should look like for Hamilton County. And so leading up to even doing this, um, this plan, we spent a lot of time in the community. Um, and I'm going to, uh, I feel like this is going to be my way to segue into issue seven, because I think in these moments, the Better Bus Coalition, uh, I feel like laying the groundwork for what we were going to do with issue seven helped us push it over the finish line because we spent, a lot of time in municipalities um, that I wouldn't necessarily say are the most liberal places, but you know, um, those people voices needed to be heard on this issue too. They need public transportation just as much as the city. And you know, um, I don't know if people know, uh, but most people on this call probably do in 2000, and two, uh, issue uh, Metro Moves failed. The last transit issue that, you know, that the county had went for, and has went for since up until issue seven. And so, you know, the appetite was not there. And so going back around to that, segue in back to what I'm saying before, you know, uh, we took this issue out into municipalities, you know, who, where we felt like their voice wasn't heard on Metro Moves. So we made their voice heard on this, on what we were pushing. We didn't know it was gonna be issue seven at the time. We were just pushing a vision for what we wanted to do. So same way into issue, how issue seven uh, came about because by this time, you know, the mayor was reelected. Even though we opposed him, we supported uh, his opponent simply because he had made some promises about transit that he didn't keep. You know, he talked about this issue in 2013. And he did not follow through with it uh, during his first term, um, you know, as, as mayor. And, you know, again, like that was the only issue that we were talking about. So. We wasn't worried about any of the other things that is wrong with our current mayor. We were only focusing on transit. Like that was it. And, you know, we wanted to keep it fair just like that. And so we supported, uh, you know, his opponent. She lost. But within that, we started a conversation that you hadn't seen in this region in a very, very long time. And, you know, uh, even even in that, con in that initial con first conversation, the political will was not ready just yet. And so we had to give them one more push. And what we did was we, the Better Bus Coalition said that if, you know, the powers that be or the sort of board don't remedy this issue by putting something on the ballot, then we were going to do it. And our proposal, was to raise the earnings tax, uh, which was something that the business community was staunchly against. And so that was the final push to get them, you know, uh, as expected, uh, to a place where they were, you know, supporting a good issue. And, you know, I'll be honest, it was not a perfect, you know, uh, there are some things about the plan that even, you know, uh, after passage, you know, I still uh, don't think should be in it. But uh, I think that this journey taught me a lot about coalition building and like just being able to, you know, uh, meet in the middle. 
And as hard as it is sometimes for me, because, you know, it's just, it just is sometimes, you know, but it was not hard in this instance because this is what we wanted to do. So issue seven was a plan to raise our uh, sales tax. We paid for a transit currently through uh, a payroll tax of 0.3 if you work in the city, then you pay uh, 0.3 of your 2.1 to Metro. And that has been in effect since the 70s. And that's part of the issue too, is that the way that we fund transit is outdated. Uh, we are the only city in Ohio, uh, besides Toledo, the only city in Ohio that's not fund, that does not fund transit via sales tax. And so that's what issue seven does here is it raises your sales tax. A hundred million of the money raised will go to a, a plan called Reinventing Metro. And, uh, you know, basically within Reinventing Metro is making our bus system uh, 24 hours on uh, the highest frequencies more crosstown routes, uh, more weekend frequencies, because our weekend frequencies are horrible. So uh, doubling the weekend frequency, more early uh, times, you know, and just uh, more express, more uh, county routes, circulators, um, and just a BRT, which is bus rapid transit, um, along corridors, and again, uh, I would encourage you all to go check out uh, the Better Bus Coalition plan because in, within that plan, all of those things are what we discussed in it. The Ravenny Metro is basically a smaller version of what we proposed a year ago, you know, a year prior to them uh, doing this. And so that is the biggest reason why I supported it because it was, you know, when it comes to, when it comes to the transit system, it's basically everything, you know, we asked for. So, you know, so yeah, I mean, I feel like I've been on the soapbox, but. We love it. <laughs> <laughs> well, so Cam, uh, we do have one question, which maybe we can throw to you now. Um, it's from Rich. He wondered sort of what was the breaking point that led the chamber and the business community to kind of migrate over to our side. I mean, you mentioned that your uh, Better Bus Coalition um, ballot initiative, which we were all working on last summer, was something that kind of applied some pressure. But was there like a, a tipping point at any point? Yeah, um, I would say the ballot initiative was huge because while behind closed doors they were trying to tell me that it would fail, I already knew that it would pass. You know, um, there was a council member who told me that it would fail 90 to 10 and, uh, you know, they would get the unions against us. And I'm like, you know, that's a scare tactic. Raising the earnings tax, uh, it's not the boogeyman in our city. And it, they knew that, you know, and so that, I think that was a huge thing. But beyond that, I think it was just about timing too. Because, I mean, we had seen a few elections where Hamilton County was pretty blue, you know, and I think that was part of the the apprehension too, is that we didn't, I mean, we we knew, but when it comes to transit, nothing, I mean, this, it never passed. This has never been successful on the county scale. So I think there was some apprehension in that regard too, but I think that this was the right election. Um, and then, I mean, you saw how close it was, Nathan. Uh, I think, that it was right, it was right on the money because I, even without COVID, I think we probably only would have passed by two or three points. I don't think it would have been too crazy or anything like that. So, um, so yeah. So really quickly, I'm gonna just kind of reiterate what I put into the chat and then throw another question to you, Cam. Um, so just so everyone knows, the, uh, now that issue seven has been successful and we can't say enough 
uh, yay and congratulations to Cam and the Better Bus Coalition and all of the other folks that, that work so hard on this and certainly to our uh, fantastic volunteers with the Sierra Club as well. Um, I think we all worked really well together and it's awesome that we're continuing to do that. Um, just so folks know, the tax is going to start being collected in October. Right. The money will not start to go actually into Sorta's uh, pocketbooks until January 2021. So that leaves us with a few months where they do intend to kind of tweak the reinventing Metro plan and, and get more public input. So I think one of our other action items for tonight is to encourage everybody to participate in that conversation. And as Cam mentioned, um, the Better Bus Coalition put together its own plan, its own reinventing Metro plan. And I think that's a great place for us all to start and advocate from um, over the next few months as, uh, as Sorta is taking these questions. So um, can you say a little, little bit more about that? Um, you know, like, is there anything that is very different from your plan versus what the reinventing Metro consultant plan kind of came out to be? No, and I'm I'm glad you brought up the word consultant because they're trying to <laughs> they're trying to uh, hire consultants again, and that's our thing is like just go and read our plan. It's exactly what reinventing Metro is. Um, it's a it's a bit smaller, you know. Uh, we're much more ambitious than Metro, but <laughs> you know, uh, outside of that, outside of uh, outside of that, you know, um, the routes are basically the same. The vision of BRT is the same. Clean, uh, cleaning our fleet, you know, making our fleet cleaner. You know, we share that vision as well. So they just need to implement our plan, you know, um, and that is exactly what we're going to be pushing for as well. Awesome. Well, let's see. I'm just going to do a quick time check. It's uh, about 10 to 8. So if it's okay with you, Cam, maybe we'll turn it over to Kevin for a minute. And then when, uh, when Kevin's run through his presentation, we can um, we can open it up for questions, and, and if there's anything else that you'd like to add, uh, we can open the floor back up. Does that sound good? Sounds good, my friends. All right. How's everybody doing? Yes, this is awesome. Um, I'm really enjoying hearing from Cam, and I'm really excited to hear from Kevin as well. Uh, as mentioned earlier, Kevin is a volunteer extraordinaire uh, with the Sierra Club and many other organizations with a um, long history in social and environmental activism and advocacy um, and has been uh, turning his uh, prodigious research talents and analytical skills to thinking about how we can affect this clean green commute campaign and get SORTA and other transit agencies to make a practical, affordable and clean transition to uh, zero emission vehicles. So Kevin, without further ado, thanks for joining us tonight. I'm gonna, do, would you like to share your screen? I would like to share my screen. Yeah. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and, and turn that over as well. All right. Let me push the button and away we go. Uh, cool. All right. Uh, so we are up and running. So this is about electric buses, uh, a helpful guide to why we want to electrify, how we're going to do it and how it should go. To kind of set the stage for folks, um, let me move some pictures out of the way here. Set the stage for folks. Um, so why do we want to transition to electric buses? Two big things are kind of local and global. So buses primarily run on diesel. I know sort of has some hybrids, but we're going to focus mostly on diesel for the moment. Uh, they, ex uh, they, you know, uh, um, emit particulate matters. They cause local air quality concerns. They can reduce lung function, cause and exacerbate asthma, um, just do all sorts of nasty things to the air that folks breathe. Uh, and then there's also a health cost attached to that, obviously. So uh, this is from a combo of what SORTA had reported, as well as some data from the EPA, that there was about $21 million worth of health costs between the PM 2.5, so particulate matter, and then the NOx emitted by the, uh, the buses driving around in 2017, which is the latest year that they've reported their data so far. Uh, also, as we're you know, uh, digging up fossil fuels, putting them into engines and burning them. We're putting carbon out into the atmosphere. Uh, so that's, you know, marching towards climate chaos. Uh, we burned 29,000 metric tons of greenhouse gases, or rather put those up in the, in the air in 2017. Um, so that's not great. Um, so those are definitely problems we'd like to avoid. Battery electric buses, not only are they cleaner and greener, there's also a lot of like technical reasons to do these. So um, 
without having to take in the fuel and then burn it because you get a lot of waste heat when you're burning fuel uh, by just converting directly from energy into mo or electricity into motion, they're like 70 or 80% efficient. Whereas um, burning, you know, diesel is like 20 or 30%. So you get a two to three times efficiency boost. So you spend a lot less on fuel in this case being electricity instead of diesel. Uh, also, uh, electric buses have about 70 moving parts, uh, while uh, diesel buses have about 3,700. So with fewer parts moving, you have less parts that can break, uh, which requires less maintenance. So it's low, a much lower cost per mile for maintenance uh, for electric versus diesel. There are a couple of uh, National Renewable Energy Lab studies that have confirmed that. Uh, there are much lower life cycle emissions. We'll show the uh, Union of Concerned Scientists has looked into that. Uh, in a, for our region in particular, we get about uh, an electric bus is about twice as efficient. Uh, um, diesel buses would have to be twice as efficient as they are to be comparable to electric buses with our current fuel mix as it is. And then hopefully we'll keep pushing it greener and greener to make buses even, uh, even more green. Also from a financial sense, um, electric buses actually just have a lower total cost of ownership than diesel. Uh, there's a high upfront cost, but then less operations, less maintenance, lower environmental externalities, end up netting out to be a better investment in the long run. So it's not a function of what we can afford, it's just how we pay for things. And there are some issues though, it's not a perfect fit yet. Everybody's concerned about range anxiety, lots of folks talk about that, uh, which we'll address in a little while. And like I said, there are high upfront costs, but then fuel is much cheaper and O&M is a lot cheaper. Um, so there is just a sticking point of getting over that upfront hurdle. Um, so this is from uh, a tool from the Argonne National Labs. It's called Athletes, uh, and it shows, it's just um, kind of like a, I know it's a little bit pixelated there, and I apologize for that, but it shows the total cost of ownership for diesel buses, electric vehicles, fuel cell vehicles, and then compressed natural gas buses in that order from left to right. Uh, and you can see that the cheapest one is the electric vehicle. So these are the total cost of ownership. So from when the bus starts to when, um, you know, to when they're done with it and they retire it. Um, and then the biggest cost there for EVs is that capital cost. So as the technology improves, as batteries get cheaper, it'll get even more and more advantageous. Um, so you can see right now it's beating its fossil fuel uh, opponents at the moment, just on total cost of ownership alone, uh, which is really exciting for folks who want to adopt, uh, you know, greener, trans uh, greener transmit, uh, transit. Um, so then this is a deeper dive into total cost of ownership. This is from Bloomberg New Energy Finance. And so you can see the, um, the dollars per, it's, it's from the UK, or it's, uh, it's in kilometers, which is frustrating, but the general, uh, the point stands regardless. So they've got um, a dollars per kilometer for miles traveled for uh, total cost of ownership. And then they've got total distance driven on the horizontal axis. And so you can see the dark black dashed line is the total cost of ownership for diesel buses. And then the different colored lines are different types of battery electric buses. Um, and so you can see as, uh, again, the, the big problem is the high cost of ownership versus the low cost of operations and maintenance. So the more folks drive, the more folks use battery electric buses, you can see more and more of them getting uh, comparably cost effective or even more cost effective than diesel, uh, all the way down to at about 90,000 kilometers. Uh, all of the different options they studied are cost effective uh, compared to the diesel. So this is kind of an, an, uh, an indication of where we should go with this and the fact that the technology is great and the more we use the buses, the more cost effective they become. Um, so as far as feasibility, like can we do it? You know, this is all really great on paper and the models are really cool, but are folks able to do it? And the answer so far has been yes. Um, the biggest example has been Shenzhen, China, which has over 16,000 battery electric buses in service. Uh, there are a number of cities, I think about 99% of all electric buses are in China right now. So we're starting to pick up in the US, but we're nowhere near what they have done. Uh, Seneca, South Carolina was the first city. It's a small college town, but they went 100% electric in 2015. They've had really great success with that. Uh, King County, which is where Seattle is in Washington, They've done a feasibility study to say that they could transition to 100% electric by 2034, and they're currently on their way to doing that. Uh, I know they've, they've passed the motion to be 100% electric. I think it's by 2040, it might be 2035, but they're, they're aiming for that already, and they've decided to set their stake in the ground to, uh, to commit to that, which is really exciting. Um, so by the end of 2018, 13% of all transit agencies either had electric buses in service or on order. 
Um, let me see, there are about 2,200 of them uh, in 2019, and 97% are battery electric buses. Um, I can't see the questions right now, but I'm sure some folks are wondering why we don't talk about fuel cells. Um, fuel cells had a much higher total cost of ownership in that previous slide. Also, they're just not nearly as prevalent. They're only 3% of the zero emission buses. So I wanted to focus on what's been deployed right now and what we could really move towards in the future. Um, uh, yeah, so basically then there's also the National Renewable Energy Labs that have shown that there are comparable performances to diesel and compressed natural gas buses uh, in terms of you know, cost per mile for operations and maintenance and uh, you know, the performance, uh, the, you know, their ability to perform and their ability to, to be able to be used when, um, when folks need to depend on them, that they're all, they're pretty comfortable at this point. Uh, and then Green Tech Media has said that battery electric buses adoption is expected to triple by 2025. So it's definitely on a very positive slope. So this is kind of a graphical representation of what I just said. You can see that, uh, so this is all the zero emission buses. So this is battery buses and fuel cell buses. Uh, California has most of them, uh, which isn't surprising. They're uh, kind of on the bleeding edge of this stuff usually. So they're living up to their reputation. Uh, the next one is Washington State, which kind of in the same camp. Um, Florida surprised me. I haven't seen a ton about Florida, but apparently they're the, the next highest. Uh, and you can see it kind of goes down from there. We're, towards the end of the middle of the pack at 36. Uh, so far, none in the Southwest, but I think Columbus and Lake Tran and one other transit agency have electric buses or fuel cell buses. Um, so there is definitely some motion going on in our state. Uh, and then we're hoping to bring it here to Southwest Ohio soon. So like I said, there are some issues. Um, the buses aren't a perfect fix for what we've already got. There are, you know, we've just got to fix some implementation stuff. Uh, the first one is always range anxiety. People are worried that they're not going to have enough juice in the batteries to get them where they need to go. Um, so it turns out we don't need to go super far uh, for buses. The average U.S. bus travels 130 miles a day. I think that was from the American Public Transit Association. Uh, for SORTA, it's a little bit less than that. In 2017, they traveled 11.2 million miles with 357 buses. So they traveled about 86 miles a day. Um, electric buses get about 2.2 to 2.8 kilowatt hours per mile. Those are from some NREL studies. So that means we would need buses that are between, you know, between 200 and 250 kilowatt hour buses, uh, bus batteries for their buses. So there are a number of manufacturers that make those right now. According to that Bloomberg study we looked at before, there are buses with over 600 kilowatt hour batteries. So, you know, more than, uh, a little bit more than double uh, what those are requiring or what those are available. So we can definitely hit those sorts of ranges. Also, there are plenty of options for in-route charging. You can do um, uh, pantographs, you can do like overhanging things that you can plug into the bus. You can do other plugs or you can do wireless charging, which is pretty cool. There's no moving parts. You just park over the charger and it charges your bus. Uh, which is which is really cool, pretty expensive, but really cool. Uh, and then for the as far as the um, the record for what folks have done so far, uh, the uh, manufacturer Proterra has gotten a bus to go 11, 1,102 miles on a single charge. I don't think they had any passengers in that bus, but still, like they are, like the technology is going really, really far, really, really quickly. So we really shouldn't worry about range anxiety. Then there is the issue of extreme weather. So if it's really hot or it's really cold, the batteries aren't quite as lively. They can't hold as much charge. Um, also, a lot of it has to do with the fact that um, it's very energy intensive to try to heat the whole cabin or cool the whole cabin. Um, so there are, there are a number of places that have adopted. So New York, Chicago, a number of places in Canada have adopted electric buses, tested them out, and they're moving forward with it. I think British Columbia is going to go 100% in the next 10 or 15 years. Um, and so what they're doing is like a short-term fix for some buses is just installing supplementary power sources to do heating or cooling. Uh, and then in the future, increased capacity, increased technology will be able to solve the problem. Um, I saw some articles about solid state batteries that'll be able to be much more charge dense, uh, much more tolerant to weather uh, variations and swings. So that'll be a, uh, a good move forward, which is coming down the line. Uh, and then finally, there are some issues with steep grades. So, you know, obviously it takes more energy to get up a steep hill than to go coasting on a flat level. And so those steep hills can uh, drain batteries. And since that is a steep city, it's got a lot of hills, seven hills, I think. Um, and so that's an issue that we need to think about. Uh, and so as the technology has improved, again, this is a problem that's going away. 
Uh, Proterra, again, has a drive chain with two electric motors. So they've got 510 horsepower. They can get up a 26% grade. I think the standard you have to make is like 20%. Um, it's twice the performance of the average 35 to 40 foot diesel bus. So they're already lapping the, the predecessors and the old technology. Um, so that's, you know, these things are being solved right now. Uh, as the technology is kind of coming down the learning curve and we're figuring out how to get better with it, uh, then the, these, these issues will be going away. Uh, the other question that I, I alluded to before is, um, is it better for the environment? You know, a lot of folks say, well, our power is still mostly gas and coal. Uh, is that better than burning gas in your car or saving natural gas and coal power in your bus? And the answer is yes. So this is a study from the Union of Concerned Scientists. They have the life cycle warning emissions from different types of buses. You can see diesel is the worst. These are all in uh, grams of carbon dioxide per mile. So diesel is the worst, followed by natural gas and diesel hybrid, which you'd expect being half diesel, half electric, it would be halfway down, but it's actually, uh, it's much higher, much more polluting than you would expect. And you can see that um, the battery electric with the average grid mix is, um, is much, much lower. It's almost, it's like two and a half times lower. Um, and then the mix here in the Ohio, I think it's in PJM, but in the Ohio area, um, battery bus or uh, fuel, but diesel buses, excuse me, diesel buses would have to be twice as efficient as they are to match the, um, the emissions of electric buses. So diesel buses aren't gonna get twice as efficient. So there's really no way to bridge that gap. Um, so electric buses are already cheap, are already cleaner than, um, than diesel or diesel hybrid buses are. And as we continue to green the grid, that's gonna get even better and better. So then the other question is, how do you afford it? Uh, like I said, we are moving down the technology curve. This is another uh, uh, graph from that Bloomberg report. And so you can see back in 2016, it was uh, about 5,500 or about 500, or sorry, it's about, um, $550,000, I guess, for a bus. Um, it's coming down the curve. I don't know if this quite matches the current numbers we have. Typically, I see right around 600,000. This might be a little bit low because this was for Europe values, but you can see the progress and you can see the fact that we're hitting price uh, parity at about 2025, 2026. So the whole problem with the high upfront cost is gonna go away in the next five or six years. Um, so that's good to see. But then until then, there are different financing uh, mechanisms we can talk about. So, you know, typically if you can come up with the upfront cash or if you can do, you know, municipal bonds, loan financing, if we could group together with other, um, other agencies uh, or other transit authorities to purchase together to lower down, the, uh, to bring down the cost, those are great ways to go forward. If we don't have the upfront cash or if we're worried, um, so one of the problems is that the price is falling so quickly that people are actually hesitant to go out and buy a bus. Sort of like when, um, you know, when cell phones are expanding so quickly, like why would you buy an iPhone 8 when the iPhone 10 is about to come out? That's basically what's happening with battery electric buses. Uh, so some people are kind of waiting and seeing. Uh, also, because it's such a new technology, we're not sure what's going to happen at the end of life. If the batteries can be sold to do other applications, uh, what you can do with the batteries once they're no longer transit grade. Um, and so a lot of folks are financing it. So uh, I think Proterra, BYD, some of the other manufacturers will do, uh, will do financing where they'll um, put up the initial capital and then you'll pay over time. And so that gets rid of that big high upfront cost. Now you're hitting price parity and then you have to pay more, per, you have to pay something per month or per year, but because your O&M costs are so much lower than they were before, you're still netting out positive. So it's a good business investment for you to do the financing if you have to. Uh, there's also pay as you save, which is kind of the same idea, uh, but within electric utility. So they're doing this in Portland now where um, you know, the electric buses are, are a huge boon to the electric uh, utility because they're gonna be a huge demand for the next you know, several decades. Uh, and so the electric utility puts up the front, fronts of the cash uh, and then they own the buses and then they, uh, you, the transit authority would pay them off over time. Um, there are also state, federal grants. There's the uh, VW grant from the, um, the settlement that happened a couple of years ago. Um, there are a couple of things that folks can apply for uh, so those are all um, all financing options that can help bring down that upfront cost, which as we've seen is probably going to go in the next five years. But for agencies that are chomping at the bit to uh, to buy these things, these are all options that can uh, can be used in the short term.
And then, um, you know, as Nathan had said, we, the, the goal of the Clean Green Commute campaign is to do zero emission transit powered by solar energy. So I just wanted to give two like kind of back of the envelope calculations on ways to do that. So uh, like I said, Metro drove 11.2 million miles in 2017. And so that's about 24, 25,000 megawatt hours of power. Uh, sort of has two large depots, one in Bond Hill, one in Queensgate. Uh, and then doing some assumptions on like, you know, how much solar you could fit, how efficient the solar is, that gives us about 5,400 megawatt hours. So we could produce about a quarter of the power we need just from the rooftops of the transit authorities, of the transit authority. Again, these are very rough numbers. We would need to do a lot more analysis before we could go forward with it, but ballparking it, we're right around 20, 25% just there on the roofs. Uh, you would need to probably install battery storage if you want to use that power, but you could always net meter it onto the grid and buy power back at night if you're charging it then. Um, also, there's that big solar installation over in Highland County. Um, we could, you know, solar sort of could buy power from that. There are a lot of options, but these are just kind of two big ones that come to mind. Uh, and so I wanted to leave you with a couple of recommendations. These are from a PERG report. Um, so number one recommendation is commit to full transition of electric buses on a timeline that creates some demand certainty. It kind of spurs other neighbors to, to get their act together and do the same thing. The demand certainty can help with production, which helps lower prices. It's just kind of a virtuous cycle you can get going. Um, also, it's important to partner with the electric utility. You need to consult with them early and often because you're going to need a lot of power at the depots and then at any in route charging stations you're going to have. So make sure that they're able to provide it, that you have all the necessary permits, procedures, right of ways, whatever. Uh, and then another thing is the, uh, the demand charge. So you require a lot of power when you're charging for a couple of hours, um, especially in route, especially for like very quick charging. Then there are very high demand charges on that based off of the, the load of power over the unit of time you're doing. Um, agencies such as in Denver and other places have been able to negotiate with their utilities to bring that price down, to incentivize off-peak charging, get reasonable demand charges, uh, and that's helped them save a lot of money on their electricity costs, which has passed the savings on uh, through the rest of the agency. Um, also, some of the folks that were early adopters had issues with their contracts. Um, I think Albuquerque was probably the biggest problem where they had to sue their manufacturer and get the buses taken back and those sorts of things. So uh, just as a kind of a word to the wise for the transit agency, make sure that there are strong consumer protections in the contract. So if anything were to go wrong, you're not left holding the bag. Um, you need to be realistic about the capabilities of the buses, uh, you know, have them, don't just rely on models, actually test run your buses, make sure that everything works smoothly. Um, and then the goal is to, you know, invest in as large a fleet as possible as soon as a proof of stock cap, soon as a proof of concept can be established. Uh, that's because we're not just thinking locally, but globally. And the goal is to really move as many transit agencies as possible to zero emission transit. And so as soon as we can be kind of like a shining example, then the folks around us, we can be, you know, technical information, we can show folks how it's done, and also be, uh, be a strong incentive for other nearby agencies to, uh, to follow the same path. Uh, you know, it's important to get as much data as possible from people that are already doing this. And then um, when you're showing these things, you know, not only include the, the operations, the maintenance, the fuel cost savings, those sorts of things, but the environmental and health benefits. Uh, so I had mentioned that there were millions of dollars of health costs from um, the emissions from 2017. Chicago has looked into it and found that for every electric bus they buy, they save about $50,000 in health costs, 50 or $60,000 in health costs. So it's huge. Um, and those need to be factored in that we're not just changing the way we're doing transit, but we're changing the way that folks can breathe cleaner air and live more healthy lives. And that needs to be factored into the, uh, the positive side of this equation. Uh, and that is what I got. Hope I didn't talk too fast for you. Uh, Kevin, that was and awesome. I'll kick it back. That was fantastic. Um, Thank you. I, I can't speak for everybody, but I not only learned things, um, but you did it so clearly. Uh, so that's fantastic. And for everyone's edification, you know, Kevin has done a lot of those calculations specifically for SORTA. And so mm -hmm. one of our next steps is to um, sort of help package that information and actually give it to the powers that be, um, much like the bus coalition has uh, given them the reinventing Metro plan so that they can then use our data and recommendations um, 
in their decision-making process. Cam mentioned in the chat earlier that, uh, that Daryl uh, Haley, who's the CEO of Metro, has been talking about electric buses. We've certainly been uh, touting this for a while now. Um, our focus you know, has been on issue seven for the last several months. And so now that it is uh, it, it, you know, in our review mirror, um, this is now what we're gonna be hammering sort of on. So <laughs> here we go, buckle up. Um, we're gonna, I, I'm gonna turn to questions in just a second, but I do wanna remind folks, I'm gonna um, share my screen again here real quick uh, as soon as I take off my Twitter feed. Um, what am I doing here? Uh, we do have these weekly calls on Tuesday nights at 5.30 uh, over Zoom like we're doing now. And um, they're a great way for folks to get sort of involved in the nitty gritty of our activism and help us uh, with our next steps. So we're actually gonna have our next call tomorrow at 5.30. Um, and uh, you can get the information from Nicole or myself, uh, or I think the add up as well. So look forward to seeing more of you in the future. Um, one quick question for Kevin, and then mm -hmm. we can turn it over to more questions. But Gene wanted to know um, how long it takes to charge the average electric bus battery. So it, it depends on, like I was talking about the demand charges. Um, it depends on the, uh, the electric configuration that you've got. Um, so I guess a typical bus would be probably about 250 kilowatt hours. And then say for like a depot charger, depot chargers are usually around 50 kilowatts. So you can charge them at about five hours. Um, so that, you know, if you've got like 10 hours, you can charge two buses. Um, and then you kind of have to stagger them sometimes. Um, for in-route charging for like um, pentagra pantographs or wireless conducting, wireless charging or um, other plug-in stuff, that can be like a couple hundred kilowatt hour or a couple hundred kilowatts. So you can charge those in like, you know, it's not always for like a full charge, but you can get about a half a charge or so in like, you know, maybe 15 minutes, maybe 30 minutes, uh, depending on how much time you've got for layovers. Um, so it, it really depends on the configuration, but the in depot stuff is usually four or five hours. And then the on route stuff is a lot, a lot faster than that. And as Kevin mentioned earlier, this technology is on an exponentially upward curve. And so, by the time an agency like Sorta would get the money uh, to pay for these buses and start signing contracts, we're talking months out, right, from now, mm -hmm. and uh, likely things are gonna be even better, more efficient, um, with you know, faster charging times and, and longer ranges and things like that, because sure, uh, sure. that's certainly the trend. Um, we've got another question about, are there uh, any talks about expanding the system beyond just buses, light rail, um, maybe going back to the old Cincinnati subway, which would be very interesting. Uh, we actually have a lot of legacy transportation projects um, in the Cincinnati area. We've got funiculars in the hills and canals under the streets um, and mm -hmm. all kinds of great things. Um, really quickly, and then I want to turn the question over to Cam uh, as a representative of the Better Bus Coalition. Um, but, you know, certainly the, uh, the Sierra Club has just sort of refined our position on the Cincinnati streetcar as a, for example, um, which uh, has the potential as a light rail system to be a, a, a significant part of our public transit system if it's expanded to places like the uptown area um, and east and west, uh, i.e. connecting people with the places that they live, work, are educated, uh, worship, etc. cetera. Um, and so uh, we've always kind of had our eye on various light rail proposals as they bubble up. Um, it's tricky, uh, both politically and uh, just in terms of technical, technical feasibility in our area, um, but it's something that I think we're always leaving on the table, if you will. But, um, you know, Cam is president of the Bus Coalition, uh, certainly is focused on buses, but he might have some more thoughts about sort of an overall system as well. Yeah, um, and you're right about that, Nathan. There's a lot of uh, political waters to tread there when it comes to talking about rail. Uh, you know, in this region, and that is uh, one of the reasons why, you know, issue seven was about buses because, you know, Metro moves, you know, they put some rail in there and, you know, it went down big. So, um, to answer the question though, there is no like formal plans uh, as far as Metro's perspective. Um, out there for real. But I will say that um, 
the hundred million that's going towards reinventing Metro could be spent on rail. So, I mean, it's not um, out of the realm or anything like that. Uh, the money just can't be spent on the streetcar, but it can be spent on rail. Um, so we'll see what's down the line. I think that uh, once we roll out the BRT, the bus rapid transit, I think the appetite will uh, become pretty heavy for more of that. And uh, you might as well build rail if you're going to build, you know, BRT. So that's my answer. And I support it too, even though, you know, I'm a bus coalition guy, but I definitely support uh, rail and, you know, uh, making uh, that stuff more robust. Uh, imagine going from Mason to the airport. I mean, you just can't beat it. Like, so um, we need that stuff in our region. I support it. Well, we at the Sierra Club definitely talk a lot about multimodal, you know, networks and connections where you're not only riding the bus uh, or riding your bicycle or walking, um, but also taking things like light rail or, or paratransit or things like that. Um, you know, and I appreciate that perspective, Cam. Um, I, I think it's undeniable that one of the reasons, one of the many reasons why the Better Bus Coalition has been so successful is because of your focus on the bus system and ridership and improving those things. Um, it's not to say that you don't think about all of the rest of those issues and have plans for them, but when you're messaging, when you're talking to leaders and the public, having that laser focus, um, I think has, has only helped broadcast the message. And so that might be something we at the Sierra Club can, can learn some lessons from how to, how to kind of target our messaging. Um, so certainly we'll welcome any more questions from the audience, but I guess uh, I haven't warned them about this, but I was wondering, I mean, Kevin and, and Cam, you, you gave us some wonderful presentations. Was there anything in, uh, in anyone else's uh, presentation or conversation that sparked your interest or, or questions um, maybe away from what you actually presented on? Um, I don't want to put you on the spot, but do you all have any questions for each other? And granted, folks, these guys talk every week, but. <laughs> you first, my friend. Okay. Um, I guess what's, so we, we passed the, you know, the issue seven. And that's going forward. That's awesome. Um, how much community input is there going to be? What's what's like? What are the steps between like them, you know, like them passing it, and then they're going to start getting the money, and then they're going to start implementing something new? How much left? How much sort of public input and work is there for the community to do to uh, to get that to be the best thing it can be? Yeah, um, and that's a good question. I uh, talked to uh, Daryl Haley about you know, what the community engagement is gonna look like now that issue seven has passed and, you know, uh, the funding will be different and what, what kind of uh, service will be going out first, stuff like that. Um, and immediately what can happen here is you can improve your weekend service and uh, roll out 24 hour service as well. Mm -hmm. uh, some of our buses that we have retired, I mean, if you notice, when I was talking about, you know, buses breaking down and stuff like that, it's the exact opposite these days. I mean, I've, I can't tell you the last time I've been like on a bus that broke down or anything like that. So our fleet is pretty new and we've been able to stockpile some of our older buses and that is going to allow for them to roll out uh, some more of that service faster than they, uh, you know, uh, while they're, of course, uh, ordering more buses and purchasing those, and uh, that's going through the system. So, um, but to your uh, point about uh, community engagement, um, yes, there's gonna be um, community engagement. I don't know the timeline of that, but I do know that the Better Bus Coalition, um, uh, that is something that's on our radar too. I was on a call with, um, some elected officials out in the suburbs uh, were mainly thanking them for, you know, you know, helping us get issues in the past, but just engaging them around what they want and what, and, you know, uh, I shouldn't say like what they want, but what is best for their community, you know, I mean, what is their community saying, you know, to them? And so I think that uh, you could be seeing some engagement from them very soon. 
um, engaging Daryl about making sure that he uh, reaches out to their community. And so I think you're going to start seeing a cry for, you know, kind of what is the next steps for them. But I know from our perspective, we will be going to those communities and asking, you know, what they want. And, you know, uh, like I said, really pushing our plan because I don't think there's uh, any need to, uh, for the sort of board to hire any more consultants. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, uh, we, we don't need any consultants. We're the consultants and the plan's there. So um, that's what we want to be pushing. Well, thanks, Kim. And I think that sort of answers Gene's question, which is how are we going to pay for this community engagement? Um, I mean, certainly sort of does things from time to time to try to hold public meetings, but they're impossible at the moment and things like that. So um, it really probably is incumbent upon groups like the Better Bus Coalition and the Sierra Club to do a lot of that public education um, in, our, in our capacity as, as advocacy organizations and with volunteers. Um, certainly education is gonna be a critical component to increasing ridership. Um, so, you know, it's, it's very important uh, part of this. I don't know if there's anything else you wanna add about, um, about that particular topic. No, I mean, uh, yeah, you talk about ridership, you know, that's, that's a conversation that's critical now more than ever because, you know, as we're losing ridership, you know, due to the crisis that we're in, our buses aren't uh, at full capacity. The way that they do this is going to be critical because, you know, you're going to have to instill uh, the public's trust. The public's going to have to trust you, but you're going to have to engage them in a way uh, that they feel heard. And so this will be an a interesting kind of point for our transit agency to see, you know, how they lay it out. But, you know, as you said, uh, Nathan, that's something that our organizations definitely should be a part of, is just kind of, kind of spearheading that, you know, and I think that since this issue came from the people, uh, we should continue to lead it. You know, this is our issue. Well said. Speaking of leadership, um, with the transition away from the earnings tax in the city of Cincinnati to the sales tax that's countywide, we do anticipate a change in the leadership of the sort of board of trustees. Uh, right now, there are seven representatives of the city of Cincinnati and six from the county. Um, we don't, I don't think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Cam, but we don't expect those numbers, the overall numbers to even remain the same, but certainly the city does not have its it's claimed to representation anymore. Um, so we're gonna be paying really close attention to how that board gets reconstituted and, and our weekly bus coalition meetings, uh, which I would also encourage people to join. Um, there's lots of opportunities to get involved. Um, we've been talking about what that board really ought to look like. Um, and so that's an important conversation that's going on right now, um, framed against what's in the news, uh, literally today, with uh, decisions that have been made by the sort of leadership in regards to how the bus system is used um, for police um, actions, uh, which I don't, I don't know if, I don't know how much folks uh, read the newspaper today or, or heard the news, but um, uh, my understanding is that uh, Metro buses were used to transport uh, police and protesters um, last night and uh, against the wishes of the Amalgamated Transit Union. And so their, their drivers were not part of this in any way, shape or form. Um, but it's a decision that uh, is a little shocking in some ways. Um, also, I think it's happened in other parts of the country uh, and people are angry about it there too. Um, I, don't know if, I don't know if anyone wants to say anything more about that, but maybe I'll, I'll just conclude by saying, um, once again, thank you everybody for being on the call. We do hope to see you all again uh, at future meetings and with future conversations. Um, certainly if there are any more questions that people have, feel free to throw them out there. Um, but I think we could also at this point say, if there's anything that folks would like to say um, or ideas that they'd like to put forward um, or announcements that they might have on a related topic, uh, now might be a good time to do that. Maybe you can uh, raise your hand and Nicole can potentially unmute you. Uh, here's a question from Kevin on the chat. How does one find out about the, the meetings for the, the transit? Um, I believe they're all listed on that add up uh, page. So if you go to the link on the screen there, they'll They'll have that information, um, but otherwise, if you email Nicole or myself, we can send you the, the Zoom link information. And another great way too is, um, yeah, Marilyn just said it. So we do have an email list for our transit committee. So please um, 
email me or Nathan and we can add you to that Google group and we're always sending out the um, virtual meeting information um, for both the Better Bus Coalition meetings as well as um, our Sierra Club group meetings. Um, so we welcome anybody to join those lists. Um, I also really quick before we jump into more questions, I want to give a shout out. I don't think she's on the call anymore, but Christy, um, who is one of our uh, Sierra Club volunteers, I just want to give her a quick shout out for this logo on our page here, the Clean Green Commute Campaign logo. Uh, she did an amazing job and we've been using it absolutely everywhere. So just wanted to give her a quick shout out. And again, thank you, Nathan, Kevin, and Cam for joining us this evening and answering everybody's questions and, and being here. Um, I am going to go ahead and just stop the recording here. And then Nathan, we can actually go into gallery view if you want, and we can have a, a further discussion about everything.